I've tried to discuss the process of game design, but I want to also provide a framework that will help beginning designers get going with games by describing what I call the nine structures of any game. If you want to have a game that is complete, then it's going to have all nine of these things. You may decide simply to minimize one of them, but still you have made a decision. So you could decide we won't have one, such as an economy, but you've still made a decision about the economy. If you use these nine structures in conjunction with the essential questions, which will be in the next lecture, then you will have covered a lot of bases in determining what your game is going to be like. You may change your mind. This is just to get you going. Once you've got a game that's a playable prototype and so on, you won't be thinking about these nearly as much, if at all. So there are nine of them. The first is kind of a combination, theme or atmosphere, history, story, emotion, image. All of these relate to what the game, at least nominally, is about. The context for the game. If it's, an, uh, if it's in a historical game, that's obvious. If it's a game that's a story like Final Fantasy VII, that's obvious. Many video games start with some kind of emotion. For example, what is it like to be a rock star? And many rhythm games have derived from that. Some might start from an image. The designer might have a, a picture in his or her mind of something that happens. Often these are called theme, although sometimes you have games that are actually abstract games, and then the trappings of something have been hung onto it, even though those trappings have nothing to do with how the game is played or how it was designed, and then you have an atmosphere or canvas. One way or another, you're going to have these things, or you're going to decide, I have an abstract game. It has none of these. It is purely abstract. The second one is player interaction rules and number of players. And of course, one of the big decisions anytime is whether you're going to have one player or more than one player. And cooperative games often amount to one player because all of the players, all the human players, are on one side and they're opposed by the game. But there are also player interaction rules. For example, if you are playing a game around a table, is it legal to try to physically intimidate the other players? Well, generally that's regarded as a no-no, but there may be games where it is allowed. In diplomacy, the rules actively promote cheating as part of the game. Not everybody who plays diplomacy likes that, but that's what the rules say. Many games that involve more than one human player have some kind of negotiation. How much is allowed? Are deals binding or are they not? Party games have lots of player interaction rules. So you've got to decide what it's going to be like in your game. Number three is objective or victory conditions. Not every game has a victory condition. Role-playing games, tabletop ones anyway, never end. There's nothing in the rules usually that says this is the end of the game. In a video game, more often there is something like that. But even if there isn't, it, the game may run out of content and then the game is over. But you can have games that don't have victory conditions, but the players have objectives. In a role-playing game, the objective is usually, but not always, to acquire more capabilities, loot, perks, levels, whatever. But some people play just for the glory. Some people play to fill a, fulfill a role. So they make up a character and then they want to play that character even if it leads them to do something stupid that gets them killed because that's what their objective is. So there's always objectives in games even if there aren't victory conditions. The fourth subsystem here is data storage or information management. 
In a board game, frequently that's the board. In a card game, it's the cards. In a video game, the computer is storing information somewhere and may actually have something that amounts to a board. In the computer game Civilization, you have a square grid or in Civ 5, a hex grid that regularizes movement and controls the location of units, a board in effect. But every game has to store information unless it's a very, very, very simple game. Even rock, paper, scissors, if you play best two out of three, there's a data storage, but that's in the minds of the players because they keep track of who won the previous sessions. That's the very simplest form of data storage, is it's in the players' heads. Sequencing is something you have to determine. In board games, it's usually turn-based, but not always. In video games, it's often simultaneous action, uh, as in RTS's real-time, but it could be turn-based, as in games like Civ V and, Star and Galactic Civilization II. And you might think of some unusual sequencing methods. But one way or another, there is sequencing involved in what the player or players do. Number six is movement or placement. Now, some kinds of games always have maneuver and geospatial relationships, as in war games. Some don't. But in every game, you have some kind of asset that you control. And in many games, then you can move that or you can place it somewhere. In a video game, the typical video game where you have an avatar, then you're moving your avatar from one place to another. Number seven is information availability. Here again, in many board games, all the information is available to all the players, as in chess. In computer games, there's a tendency to use the computer to hide information. You have to actively program the computer to show information on the screen to the player. So typically in a video game, there is a lot of hidden information. In card games, there's hidden information. What cards you have in your hand, what cards are in the deck, when they're going to come up. The next one is conflict resolution or interaction of entities. I tend to think in terms of war games because conflict is inherent in most games and conflict is inherent in war, but in a non-war game you still have interaction of the game enti entities or assets. What can your assets do that affects the assets of another player? What can your assets do that affect the game? There's always that kind of interaction, even in a puzzle. And the last one here is economy, which is resource acquisition or conversion. Some games have very little in the way of resource acquisition. In checkers, the only resource you can acquire is a king when you get to the other side. In chess, the only thing you can do is change your pawn into another piece when you get to the furthest rank. Some games, there's no resource acquisition or conversion at all. So what you've got gradually decreases as time goes on or remains the same and doesn't increase. Economy makes a big difference. And of course, some games are wholly about economy. That many other games have no economy. Tetris doesn't have an economy to speak of. Yes, there are new forms that fall down, but it's an infinite supply. And you have no control over it. So it's a very minimal economy. So when you're thinking about a game, when you get to a certain point, look at this list and see if you've decided about these things and what you've decided. You may change your mind later, but at some point you've got to address these questions.